we have a fight that we need to fight. Mm -hmm. And we do have a master who is a master that can bring out the best in us. And that best can exceed even our expectations. And we come this morning to a study which involves a unique man and a friend of this unique man, Nicodemus the Master. And we want to consider this morning just his journey of discipleship and what the Lord made of him. I'd just like you to come back to John chapter 2 and we'll start here as the Lord in his first Passover responds to the fame that uh, he was um, he was uh, responded to uh, with by the people at his uh, first Passover. And we read in John chapter 2 and verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Our Lord was not just drawn to people just because they believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. He did not commit. And sometimes we say, well, you know, the question is, are we a committed follower of Christ? That's not the question. A relationship is a two-way street. It's whether the Lord has committed himself to us. And it will depend on what kind of man or woman we are. And the Lord didn't need an introduction for anybody that he met. He knew what was in man. He was given divine power and perception to be able to see through every man. And I love the way John writes this gospel. And you remember I spoke to you about the uh, Greek manuscripts, how that they were written just from left to right with no spaces even between words, let alone chapter breaks and, and verses and punctuation. And it reads just like that in John's gospel. He knew what was in man, there was a man. That's how it reads. Because we're introduced to a unique man, a man that the Lord is going to make strong for himself. So when we look at um, John chapter 2 and verse um, 18, the Lord had made it very clear to the Jews about what he knew they were going to do to him. And because, of course, they responded to the way in which he just came into the temple, took it over, drove out the tables of the money changers and them that bought and sold and took ownership of that house. And they said to him in verse 18, we want a sign of your authority. On what basis have you done this? And the Lord's going to give them the first of two signs. What sign showest thou, seeing that thou doest these things? And here's the first sign. He's looking at them and he's saying to them, destroy this body and in three days I'll raise it up. First sign. He didn't say, I will destroy this body, as was falsely asserted at his trial. He said to them, I know what you're going to do to me. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But, of course, we know in verse 21 he spake of the temple of his body. The second, if you're taking notes, is in Matthew 12 and verse 38 to 40, when certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he said to them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you know, the Pharisees knew that before the disciples knew that. The disciples knew that uh, after the Lord was risen, 
The Jews knew that because they went to Pilate and they said to him, this deceiver said, he prize the third day. They knew it before the disciples. So they knew what he meant. So we have now two signs that were going to be fulfilled as the vindication of the Lord's authority. And we know, of course, they were fulfilled in exact detail. And if anyone missed the sign of the prophet Jonas, there were two massive earthquakes, one at the Lord's death and one at his resurrection, which shook the whole city of Jerusalem so no one would mistake the three days and the three nights sign as evidence that he was Messiah. And they destroyed him. And in three days he rose again. Now there was a man in verse 3, no ordinary man. He's called the master, and we'll look at this when we get to verse 10. And the Greek has the definite article, art thou the master of Israel? If ever you wanted a counterpart to the master that the Lord was, the real master, if you ever wanted a counterpart to him in Jewish standing as the master in Israel, the authority on the Bible, it was Nicodemus. He was, by the Lord's reckoning, the master in Israel. Now, so we've got two masters here, the real one and the fake or the pseudo master who thinks he knows everything and the Lord's going to challenge him. And we're not going to go into this in great detail. I would love to, but I don't have the time. We have a discussion that happens in verse 3 and verse 5 about essentially two cleansings. And you'll see the language in verse 3. The, the first cleansing enables someone to see the kingdom. And in verse 5, two cleansings born of water and of spirit enables a person to enter into the kingdom. And, of course, the Lord is speaking in spiritual language and Nicodemus has no idea where the Lord's going with this. And the Lord says to him in verse 10, I mean, you are the authority on the Bible. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but, of course, you would understand that there is a template in the Scriptures for the journey of a disciple towards the kingdom. And it was in the way in which the Exodus was conducted that delivered the nation of Israel out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt into the Promised Land. And how many cleansings were there? How many waters did they pass through? Two. Red Sea, Jordan. So the parable is very evident. And you enter through the Red Sea, you have a vision of the kingdom set before you, but you need to go through the Jordan, which represents the reversing of mortality as the descending waters from the sea of life down to the sea of death are driven right back to Adam and incorruptibility and divine nature is granted so we can enter, verse 5, into the kingdom. So that... That the whole story of the Exodus is the substratum and our Lord Jesus Christ was going to conduct the greatest Exodus. He spoke of that in Luke 9, the, the decease that he should accomplish in Jerusalem. He spoke to Moses, of all people, and Elijah, men who, of course, um, are known for uh, conducting an Exodus and they were, they were going to achieve an Exodus for all of the faithful out of the land of sin and death into the kingdom. Nicodemus is struggling to know where the Lord's going. Well, of course, Nicodemus was uh, a no ordinary Pharisee. Uh, we're told that he was a Pharisee and the Pharisees, as we know, were separatists. However, they were self-righteous hypocrites and their separatism was not based on faithfulness to the law of God and the Lord definitely condemned them because in Matthew 15, verse 9, he says, In vain you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So don't ever accuse a faithful brother or sister in the truth that wants to devote themselves 100%, as faithfully as they can, to the nth degree to serve their God and to honour him as they want to in their own personal conscience and belief. Don't talk to that brother or talk of them as though they are a tick box Pharisee. That's not Pharisaism. Pharisaism 
is a man-made set of teachings and doctrines, which in Mark 7, verse 13, the Lord said, were not gods because they actually made the word of God of none effect by their traditions. They were actually breaking the principles of the truth by their traditions. These were not traditions that were there to assist the uh, manifestation of the principles of the truth. These were traditions that broke the actual laws and, and values of God. They made the word of God of none effect through their tradition. So let's define Pharisaism correctly. And let's not accuse brothers and sisters who just want to do their best for God, even to the nth degree. Let's not think that they're Pharisees. Pharisees broke the word of God by their tradition. Nicodemus's name means victor over the people. Nico, and that's where Nike um, comes from, the Greek word victory. Demas, democracy, the people, victory over the people. And he was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Uh, the word archon, the first in rank and power, if you just come over to John chapter 12, and uh, here's what these men were like. <clears throat> this is the power that they wielded, these rulers <clears throat> of, the, of the Jews. This is John 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on him. And the word chief rulers is our word uh, ruler of the Jews. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And Nicodemus was both a ruler of the Jews and a Pharisee, but he was more than that. He was the master and the authority on Bible exposition. Bullinger actually says that rabbinical trans, tra tradition makes him one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. Joseph of Arimathea, Caiaphas and Nicodemus were purported to be the three richest men in Jerusalem. So this was no ordinary man. This was no ordinary Pharisee, no ordinary member of the Jewish Sanhedrin and no ordinary master. He was also a man of great wealth and great power and influence. And he came to Jesus by night. He said to him, Rabbi, master, teacher, we, not speaking on his own behalf here, we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do these miracles except Emmanuel. So he makes a confession and the Lord is going to give Nicodemus an instruction about his destiny when he speaks to him about him being lifted up in verse 14. And, of course, we know that that is, of course, re a reference to his crucifixion. But I'd just like you to come back with me to Numbers chapter 9 because Nicodemus... And um, a friend of his, Joseph of Arimathea, were actually prefigured in the Old Testament. Amazingly prefigured. And in Numbers chapter 9, we have the record of certain men in verse 6 who come to Moses and they have a problem because it's Passover. So tuck that in the back of your mind. It's Passover because that's when our Lord is going to be lifted up, isn't it? Well, they come to Moses and they say to him, we be defiled, this is Numbers 9, verse 6, we def be defiled by the dead body of a man. They had just buried a man and come into contact with death, and so they were precluded from keeping the Passover that day. So they came to Moses and Aaron and said, we be defiled by the dead body of a man. Why are we kept back that we may not offer an offering unto Yahweh in his appointed season among the children of Israel. The Passover was the most important of all of the festivals of Yahweh, and these men were kept back, and they they didn't want to be kept back. You, you imagine we're going to have a Bible school and we're going to have this amazing program, and, well, it's almost like COVID, isn't it? Caught COVID, you can't come. Well, in this case, they had buried a man and they couldn't come. How would you feel if you were in that place? I heard... Um, I heard that Baruch couldn't come, and sadly, um, the young people uh, had to put up with um, a stand-in replacement because he wasn't able to come, Paul Boy. I feel for him because he would be like these men, thinking, why can't we come? Well, you're contagious. And so it wasn't a disease that they were contagious with. They were contaminated by ceremonial death. 
and they uh, were therefore infectious. So um, we're living in days very similar and we can relate to that. However, um, just on, on the side, I had an amazing night with the young people last night. I really enjoyed the opportunity of engaging with them. Uh, they even let me play basketball. It's a very strange game. You have to throw this ball. Normally with balls, you kick them and you kick them into goals, you know, but they have this tiny net. In soccer, you have proper goals, like they're a bit this wide. <laughs> anyway, that's fine. It's just, um, anyway, we had a lovely evening together and I was really impressed with our young people and their response to uh, the meditation and the discussions that we enjoyed at supper after. Um, so, um, um, how, did, how did we ever get to that? Oh, that's right. Sorry, I'm tracing back to Baruch and to these men. Okay, so, but a tragedy. So Yahweh responds and says in verse 10, if any man of you of his posterity be unclean by reason of a dead body or be on a journey, he will keep the Passover. So you're not going to miss out on the Bible school. However, it's going to be kept on the 14th day of the second month it's going to be a smaller event just with those people that couldn't be part of the main Bible school. And it's going to be kept on the 14th day of the second month. So think about this. So here's men that touched the dead body of a man, could not keep the Passover, and were given an extension by grace other than that which was legislated in the law so they could still keep the Passover, but it couldn't be the Passover that was legislated on the 14th of the first month. Now we need to come to Numbers 19 because these men needed cleansing from the contamination of the defilement of death. <clears throat> and in Numbers 19, we have one of the most amazing offerings that is outside the Levitical um, uh, catalog of offerings because this offering is totally unique. It has nothing to do with the tabernacle. It's offered outside the camp. It's once offered and could be used forever after. It has all of the elements of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ other than how the offerings and the sacrifices daily and, and, um, and annually were conducted under the Le Levitical law, and that's why it's in the book of Numbers. This is an amazing sacrifice, and we're not going to go into it in any detail. Suffice to say that this is the place where we have a cure for the defilement of death, the only sacrifice under the law that ever gave hope that death could be overcome and the taint of death could be removed. And it was the offering of the red heifer. And it was administered with water. And it was administered by two cleansings. So you can see now where the Lord is directing Nicodemus to because the cleansings of Israel's journey in the Exodus were summarized in this one offering that had two cleansings. And you'll see in verse 12 and verse 19, there was a cleansing on the third day of the water, which was mixed with the ashes of the heifer, and the seventh day, and you'll notice that the seventh day was also a cleansing. So the clean person will sprinkle upon the unclean the third day and the seventh day, and the seventh day he will be purified. But notice verse 12, if the third day cleansing has not been done, the seventh day will be ineffective. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because if the Red Sea and the cleansing of the third day, the day of resurrection, when we are risen with Christ, if we're not baptised, the seventh day when we cross the Jordan and we have the cleansing of the final removing of the taint of death will be ineffective. So it's very, very evident that we have a very clear um, uh, a summary of the whole Exodus parable in the way in which death would be removed and purification would be affected. But there's some really interesting details. Oh, actually, I missed one verse back in Numbers 9. Sorry. Oh, see, that's what happens when you don't read your notes. So in Numbers 9, just go back there because I, I had two things I wanted to point out that I had forgotten about. Uh, in verse 12... These men were also reminded that the Passover lamb could not remain to the morning. It had to be totally offered in sacrifice because Psalm 16 verse 10 said, concerning the Passover lamb of our Lord Jesus Christ, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. 
The other thing we're told in that verse, uh, in verse 12, I've got that. I oh, actually, uh, uh, okay, so actually that comes. I've, I've taken that from the Exodus um, record of the Passover. The other thing that's repeated here is that a bone of that um, Passover land could not be broken. And that, of course, was also um, part of the Passover uh, mm -hmm. requirements, and that's going to be fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the antitype. So I just missed those two slides. But just concerning the red heifer, in Numbers 19 now, so we're coming back to no Numbers 19, we have in verse 9 that the ashes of the red heifer are going to be laid up without the camp in a clean place. And the clean, uh, the man that is clean, we're going to see who that is in the gospel records, and we're going to see the clean place that was outside the camp. And, of course, we just read that in, uh, Brother Jeffrey read that for us in John uh, chapter 19, where in the place uh, where our Lord was crucified, there was a garden and there was a sepulchre wherein Never man was yet laid. It was not defiled by death. It was a clean place. Look at the prophecies concerning the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ in these two chapters. Okay, so we need to establish that. The other thing we need to establish is that we know, and we're going to deal with this in a little bit more detail shortly, we know that Isaiah 53 also made a prophecy concerning the Lord's burial, and that was, and I've got the RV here, that his grave was going to be appointed with the wicked. And the destiny of the Lord would have been the rubbish dump of Gehenna. However, he was with the rich in his death. So somehow the course of the destiny of the Lord by the Jews was obstructed and he was delivered out of their hands in Isaiah 53 verse 9. Uh, prophesize that. We're going to see how this is this is uh, fulfilled. So let's just come back to, we can come back to uh, John chapter 3. Uh, yes, John chapter 3 now. And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ really taking this master of Israel, who was an authority on the scriptures, really taking him to the limits of his understanding of spiritual concepts and helping him to understand he really needed to go back to his Bible and do some Bible study to see how all of those scriptures were to be fulfilled in Messiah. And so we come back to verse 10 in the end of this conversation about the two cleansings and their significance. And Nicodemus, how can these things be? He's, he really is lost. And the Lord says to him in verse 10, Nicodemus, you're the master in Israel. And don't you know what I'm talking about? And I think we must stop here, brothers and sisters, and just spend a minute just emphasising the need for us to know our Bibles. Nicodemus was a master. And we have the responsibility to be teachers. If we're parents, we're teachers. We could be teachers in Sunday school. We could be um, teachers because we, we have a, a responsibility that we're being given to lead a study or, uh, or write a book or write a paper. But we are teachers and we need to know our stuff. There's no good just sitting down with our children and doing the readings and have no idea, haven't even picked up the story of the Bible or the expositor just to flick through to make sure that we've got some basic understanding of the reading so that when we sit with our children, we can actually not just read the scriptures, but we can draw out to them the message of the scriptures and instruct our children. It's, of course, the responsibility of parents. But... This is a very important thing. We're not given the Bible for no reason. And Israel's history is a, is a testament to a lack of knowledge. And this is Hosea 4 verse 6, one of many scriptures we could go to. But lack of knowledge destroyed the ecclesia. It destroyed the ecclesia. Because they rejected knowledge. They rejected knowledge. So when someone stood up that was a spokesman on God's behalf, ah, listen to him go on about Bible exposition. and Why do we need to know this stuff? Like, honestly, I mean, Old Testament stuff too, by the, by the way. We're not living in Old Testament times. Please just tell me some 
like really encouraging things. Tell me that Jesus loves me. It tells me, tell me if I have Jesus in my heart, I'm saved. That would be really encouraging. Don't bore me with Bible study. And we have to be very careful, brothers and sisters, that we are rooted and grounded in the knowledge of the truth. And we don't despise good, solid exposition of the scriptures. Here's the Lord saying to Nicodemus, if you are teaching people and you're a teacher, you should know your stuff. Get back to your Bible and read it. And why was that important, brothers and sisters? Paul gave an exposition in Hebrews to the Jerusalem Ecclesia, and we sometimes struggle to even understand his arguments. Why was it important for him to explain the atonement to the Jerusalem Ecclesia? Because it was a matter of life and death, that's why. Because AD 70 was coming. And Paul feared that these brethren in the Jerusalem Ecclesia had not understood that Christ was the fulfilment of all that had preceded him. And they could not be justified by the law apart from Christ. And that was a matter of life and death. They needed to know Paul's exposition of the atonement because the Lord had said, you didn't know the day of your visitation and the things which belong to your peace because they're hid from your eyes. And I'm going to bring the Romans and they're going to decimate you and destroy you. That's how serious Bible knowledge is. And Nicodemus was in the same predicament. And so we need to know our stuff. And the Lord then proceeded to talk to Nicodemus about the, uh, the serpent in the wilderness from Numbers 21. We're not going to go back there either. But, of course, you know how beautiful the whole allegory of the serpents in the wilderness and the brazen serpent that was lifted up. And the, the Lord said to Nicodemus, now, listen, I'm telling you, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit of the story of the development of Nicodemus's faith, but if you want to just make a note of John 7, verse 45 to 53, you'll see how difficult it was for Nicodemus amongst his own group, and he was still one of them, we know uh, from that record. He found it very difficult. He tried to speak up for the Lord, but he was just absolutely intimidated by his colleagues, and it was very difficult for him to actually step out of the darkness of this interview and step into the light. But just before we leave John 3, have a look at verse 21. Because the Lord says to Nicodemus, you know this discussion about men loving darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But he says to Nicodemus in verse 21, he that doeth truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, revealed, in, in the open, that they are wrought in God. And that's what's going to happen. Come to John chapter 8. Nicodemus is going to see this message of the Lord being lifted up. John 8 and verse 28. Jesus said to them, when ye, he's talking to the Jews, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. You know how John chapter 8 finishes. Um, they took up stones to um, murder our Lord Jesus Christ. John 9 verse 16, we also know that the Jews were divided over the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, how can this man be a sinner uh, and do such miracles? And there was a division among them. John chapter 12. Verse 12. Uh, John 12. Oh, sorry. Verse 12 to 19 is our Lord's entry into the city of Jerusalem. Um, and I'm just going to just come to verse 32 just to save time. Um, well, verse 31 is a reference to uh, Caiaphas and the judgment that would come upon the head of the ecclesia because he was, of course, the high priest. 
the prince of this world is going to be cast out. And I, he says, if I be lifted up, there's that same expression, from the earth I will draw all men unto me. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. And then what happened as Nicodemus stood at the foot of the cross? Well, let me summarize. He had said to the Jews, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He said to the Pharisees, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you know that I am he and that what you see me do is not of myself, it's of my Father. And he said to the same group of men in John 12, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And he said to the Pharisees, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, it was in the whale's belly, I beg your pardon, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, who knew about the plans of the Jews in John 19 and verse 31? Who knew what their plans would have been? And what were their plans? Well, we know these, so we're not going to go into it in detail. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, and he is the master of Israel, Nicodemus, who's a member of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee and the master, he would know absolutely what the normal procedure would be and what was planned. So what was planned? Well, they wanted his legs broken and his body taken away. And this was, of course, regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I know that that could not happen. And uh, Edashim tells us the practice was that because normally crucified victims uh, lingered on the cross for up to a week, in cases where uh, Jewish execution was conducted because there was a requirement that they be buried before sundown, this was not just any sundown because the Passover Sabbath, the most important holy day of the year was upon them, they would have a procedure called crurifragium, which is a Latin expression, which is the breaking of the legs of the victims by clubs until they're smashed and they can no longer keep themselves up and they die, they die of excruciating pain and asphyxiation. And it's interesting, well, it's not interesting. It's actually quite hard to read that that happened to one of our brethren in verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first. And of the other, which was crucified with him. And we know who that was. That was a man that the Lord delivered from the jaws of death itself. The thief on the cross to whom he said, I say to thee today, you will be with me in paradise. And this, this man was crucified with Christ. Well, they missed the Lord out. And then, of course, John records how um, the, the spear thrust fulfilled scripture concerning the blood and water that oozed out of the Lord's side. But so why do we read such a strange thing that they went to the first and they walked past Jesus and they, they broke the legs of the other to bring about an early death and then came to the middle and found that the Lord was dead already? And I'm going to suggest in the, uh, in the brief time that we have to us that this is the story of the interception of the Jews' plan and the rescuing of the Lord's body from their hands in order to fulfil scripture at a very critical time when there was nobody else. There was no man among the 12. Well, among the 11. Like this was so critical. There were so many scriptures hanging on our Lord being delivered from the intention of the Jews and being buried, as we have just considered from the Old Testament scriptures, in a clean place by a clean man. His grave appointed with the wicked. He couldn't be thrown in Gehenna. He couldn't have a bone broken. Who was going to rescue the Lord Jesus Christ? And, of course, it was a man. 
and it was not Nicodemus. It was Joseph. And, you know, sometimes we, uh, we, um, we think, oh, wow. So it was Joseph that went into Pilate and craved and begged the body of Jesus. And all the records tell us um, that that was the case. And we sort of think, oh, wow. Okay, so we expected, you know, there was a man that it would be Nicodemus. And the discussion that the Lord had had and, and Nicodemus trying to stand up for the Lord and Nicodemus now seeing all of these things that the Lord said fulfilled. And the man, well, Luke says, behold, there was a man. This is Luke's record. So if you're taking notes, Luke 23, verse 50 to 52, we'll probably come back to, uh, well, no, we'll stay in John. There was a man and his name was Joseph. He was a counselor and he was a good man and a just, a righteous man. The same consented not to the counsel and deed of them. He also waited for the kingdom of God. He was a disciple of Jesus. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Mark says he craved the body of Jesus. He went in. And we would have loved the story if we were a Hollywood scriptwriter. We, we would write this beautiful story about Nicodemus's bravery. You know, because we've set up this, this man and we would expect that he would be the one. And, you know, brothers and sisters, I think we need to understand that God doesn't deal with nice stories. He deals with real life. And sometimes Caleb's need a Joshua. And sometimes Barak's need a Deborah. And sometimes Jonathan's need a David. And that's what God provided for this man. And John records that for us in verse 38 of John 19. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, and Nicodemus might have been one of those uh, at, at one point in his life, he besought Pilate and Pilate granted him the custody of that body. And, of course, we know if we combine the records that when, Nick, when uh, Joseph rather came into Pilate, Pilate was surprised that he was even dead and he had to go and get it checked. So that, if you align that in the chronology, that could not have happened after the legs were broken. The custody of the body was given to Joseph before the crew fragrium and the Lord therefore was, to, the soldiers were told not to break his legs. He's already dead. And the soldier, of course, out of curiosity, wanting to just check that, that was, the report was correct, fulfilled scripture in the piercing of his side, as we know. What an amazing thing for this man. And he went in. Remember, we read in the uh, record of the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jews would not go in to the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they should keep the Passover. And Joseph goes straight into Pilate because he knew he was precluding himself from the Jews' Passover. He'd already made that decision. He wasn't interested. He knew the real Passover lamb. And he chose an extension by grace other than what was legislated because he knew that that was God's Passover lamb. And he was personally involved in taking our Lord, and laying him to rest. And then John records, there came also Nicodemus, which first came to Jesus by night. Here's two unlikely heroes come out of nowhere, not even in the ecclesia, not even part of the apostles, not privileged to all of the things that the apostles were privileged to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ in greater detail than they heard. And here's a secret disciple who's too fearful to come out into the light to make manifest that his deeds are wrought in God. And here's Nicodemus who first came to Jesus by night. In broad daylight, they come to the foot of the cross so that all of the thousands of people that had flocked the city of Jerusalem and overflowed the city 
including international guests that had come to the Passover. The city was brooming and overflowing with people. These men in broad daylight made their allegiance known. He was their master. And they were going to risk their lives to pay their respects to him and fulfil scripture in the most daring and courageous move. Do you know how how open their their allegiance to Christ was? If you just come back to John chapter 19 and verse 20, look how close the site of crucifixion was to the city of Jerusalem. This title, John says, read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. So in other words, the place where Jesus was crucified was that close to the city that you could read the words that Pilate wrote on the sign that he placed upon the cross. These men came out in public view, frightened, fearful, not wanting to be open about their discipleship, too scared to speak up. Why? Well, not because someone might laugh at them if they speak about the truth at work. because they were taking their life in their hands. We know the end of the story. I mean, the Jews took over the custody of, uh, of Joseph's sepulchre, took it straight over. It became public property. They set a guard. They set a watch. And these men are never spoken of ever since. We don't hear anything about them. But look what they did. John 19 and verse 40. Then took they the body of Jesus. Mark 15, verse 46, they took him down. They did it together, yes, but it was Joseph. And there also came Nicodemus. They took him down. Jesus said, the Son of Man will be lifted up. And they took him down. And you imagine what these men did. We haven't got time to detail the story of the burial, but you know the story. You imagine them having to remove the nails from the hands and the feet of the Lord and remove the crown of thorns and wash that body and anoint that body and wrap that body and place it in the sepulchre, so rescuing our Lord Jesus Christ from the destiny that was determined for him by their once colleagues. What an amazing thing conviction of Christ can do. Two unlikely men. And, you know, brothers and sisters, there's a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful fulfilment of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Nicodemus, which he said, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. God was at work in these two men. Amazing, amazing what they did as a result of God working in their lives to achieve what nobody else apparently could do. So we fi finish in Jeremiah chapter 32. And this is a really encouraging scripture, brothers and sisters and young people. We look at our own lives and we think about how limited we are and we think about how frightened we might be and we think about the challenges and the obstacles and we think to ourselves discipleship is too hard but there's one thing that we know when we come to our god brothers and sisters and we allow him to work in our lives we find as jeremiah says i am yahweh and I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I guarantee you, if you had talked to Nicodemus and Joseph at the beginning of the Lord's ministry and described where they would finally end in their discipleship, they would have said, no way. And we might too, brothers and sisters, because we might think, no, I, that, no, not me. He was a disciple secretly for fear of the Jews and a man who could only come to Jesus by night. 
And look what God could do with those men because they were convicted of Christ. There's nothing too hard for God, brothers and sisters. All we need to do is get our heads in the Bible and understand the Scriptures and allow the power of God, who is the God of all flesh, to work in us and we will see that Christ is all in all in thee.